But thank you very much for uh, the organizers for inviting me. And uh, I really enjoyed yesterday's uh, program and, and this digital format that, that worked surprisingly well. Uh, I was uh, particularly happy to, to hear that this was uh, the, the Lund Institute of Advanced Neutron and X-ray Sciences. And uh, particularly the neutron that allowed me to pull up uh, some work that I did during my PhD, and that was uh, on a beta barrel protein. Uh, and uh, after uh, using X-rays to to get a high resolution structure, we use neutron scattering at the uh, ILL in in uh, Grenoble, uh, together with uh, contrast variation to determine the structure of the detergent in these crystals and that is shown here on this uh, in this picture and it shows this intricate three-dimensional network of the micelles in in these crystals and that illustrates clearly one of the of the challenges that we have with membrane proteins where you have your uh, interface between the hydrophobic and the, and the hydrophilic parts of the protein and that in many techniques can play uh, really tricks on, uh, on us. Uh, but then again, that interfaces is where most of the excitement uh, happens. So I'm working as, uh, as Karen said in, uh, at AstraZeneca in a group that uh, basically does the protein reagent, protein science uh, generation for early drug discovery in AstraZeneca. We have uh, a, a daughter group in the UK that is uh, mainly supporting the oncology areas and uh, we from uh, Gothenburg are supporting um, uh, cardiovascular and, and renal and metabolic diseases and uh, respiratory and, and inflammation diseases mainly. And protein science is really uh, key to many early drug discovery projects. And uh, it's important to deliver the, the right quality uh, at the right time. And many projects in the beginning, uh, when they don't have proteins, uh, simply they can't progress their projects. Uh, and uh, we need to be fast, innovative, agile and productive. And, and clearly this is a, is a managerial sentence put in there and that basically needs, you need to work harder, smarter and deliver more in less time with less people. Um, and that is what we, uh, what we aim to do. Now the proteins that we generate, and that's not only, uh, not only membrane proteins obviously, but uh, many different types of proteins. They're used in, in biochemical assays, they're used for affinity screening. Uh, we supply to uh, biochemical high throughput screening uh, uh, projects, biophysics and mode of action studies when we've progressed a bit longer in, uh, in, in projects. Uh, structure is a very important component of what we uh, deliver proteins uh, to, and then antibody generation, uh, bioanalysis, uh, uh, analysis, and also we supply proteins for uh, example, uh, in vivo PK studies. And each of these applications put different demands on the proteins that we, uh, that we deliver. Uh, and if we then look at, uh, at specifically membrane proteins at AstraZeneca, we've had a long standing interest in membrane proteins, uh, clearly because membrane proteins are a very important and, and fruitful uh, class of drug targets. Uh, already in 2005, uh, we established a structural system for the uh, MPGS, the human MPGS, recombinantly expressed in insect cells. And uh, possibly different from, uh, from academia, uh, we then continued not only with one structure, but uh, solved over 100 structures of MPGS in complex with different, uh, different compounds, and in this way, driving the chemistry forward. So it's, it's, it's uh, clearly the first structure is of, of most important, but then the iterative structure support to guide the chemistry is something that we focus a lot on. Now we've also looked at uh, some methodology development uh, and, and FSEC was mentioned uh, already a few times. Uh, we further developed that using a uh, his specific 
that we then use and we don't uh, we are not dependent on gfp anymore uh, we're looking at single molecule microscopy as an assay methodology particularly for membrane proteins uh, my director nick decker has had a collaboration with uh, with rosalyn around uh, these uh, smalls uh, and uh, more lately we've worked with dna encoded library screening and um, uh, did some methodology development around protein purification and the latter uh, is what uh, what I'll present in the first part of my presentation and in the second part of the presentation we'll be looking at a, a specific example the part two receptor that we work together with tires on uh, as well as touch upon the DNA encoded library screening so if we start with the uh, with the first part uh, it's the methodology development that we uh, that we've done on membrane protein purification and then we we need to look at the tea bag and the tea bag that was invented by two ladies in the in the US in uh, 1903. Uh, a, a picture from the patent is shown here where they have a cotton mass in a, in a metal frame in which you can put your tea bags and that you can put in your hot water making, uh, making tea uh, that never really caught on. But then a few years later, a, uh, a salesman, he accidentally reinvented the tea bag uh, as he sent samples of tea to customers soon in small sealed bags. And the customers used that to make tea. And then when he resent larger bulk packages of his tea, he got complaints that why didn't he supply them in these nice tea bags? Now, uh, when we thought about uh, protein purifications and ways of making that more uh, efficient, uh, at a certain moment, we thought, why can't we put a resin in tea bags and then use that as a purification method? So that is what we actually developed. And here you see a picture where we purified uh, histec GFP in a tea bag. So the resin is enclosed in the tea bag and it, it, it's, it's nicely colored and on UV, uh, you see the, the, the fluorescence. Now, actually, this was not only a reinvention of the tea bag, but it turned out that it was actually a reinvention of uh, a method that Parat and Sunberry already in 1971 uh, published. Uh, it it's, uh, was a group uh, in Uppsala. And they used also the concept of a tea bag uh, for, for purifying proteins. It, it never caught on really and, and was forgotten. And, and we had to re refine it ourselves. But we believe that due to development, both in, in resin, but also in expression and overexpression, the tea bag method can be a very powerful way of purification. Uh, now we explored different materials and in, in the end we ended up with a, uh, a, a PTEX, CFR PTEX material, uh, which is a mesh and it, you can get it in different mesh sizes and we ended up predominantly with the 40 micrometer mesh size, which gives an optimum between the resin particle size and, and uh, fluid exchange, we explored different shapes, uh, more exciting ones like pyramids, tetrahedrals and, and cylinders, but in the end we ended up with squares or, or rectangles as, uh, as most useful. And uh, the method can be applied in, in many, uh, many labs, it's, it's uh, low, uh, low tech, uh, basically you fold the mesh, then you heat seal on two sides you can fill it with a resin of choice and then you heat seal or you clamp down the last uh, uh, the last side so that your mesh is in your resin is enclosed in the mesh and uh, then you just take the tea bag and you throw it into your uh, solution with a protein of interest incubate it shake it and then you can fish out your tea bag wash it any loot very very convenient simple and fast now here's an example. We initially uh, developed this for secreted proteins. Here's an example of uh, human embryonic kidney cell culture. Uh, on the right hand side, conventional purification. Uh, here you see it uh, using the cleared media. And in the first 
uh, example on the on the left hand side it's actually the fermentation broth with the cells and the tea bag so you uh, you can use it immediately in your culture with cells now uh, what do we uh, what do we save we save quite a lot of time so uh, you don't have to spin down and, and get your cells from your uh, your growth you just add it uh, at the end of your growth, uh, a few hours, depending on your uh, binding kinetics, and then you pull it out the, the, the bag and you basically have your purified protein. So you can save a lot of time compared to conventional purifications. And when we apply that in, in projects, what we saw is that uh, in some cases, uh, particularly for sensitive proteins, we saw improvements in the quality and they're actually projects which uh, or, or protein targets in, in projects that, that completely rely on T-back purification to get functional uh, protein. And that probed us to, uh, to think about uh, application to membrane proteins as well. And this is a collaboration with a group of, of Pontus uh, Gordon in, uh, at uh, Lund University and in uh, University of Copenhagen. Uh, with a student of uh, of Pontus Julie and uh, together with a uh, Jenny Hering student at uh, uh, at AstraZeneca uh, supervised at Gothenburg University and uh, membrane proteins and it's it's uh, known to everybody uh, if you have them expressed in the cells what you typically do is you break the cells and you isolate the membranes. Uh, possibly ally, uh, apply a few washes, then you go to solubilization, uh, you centrifuge away your insoluble material, you apply it to purification, uh, either a column or in batch, and eventually you will lead your protein. Now, we believe that the tea bag can be applied and that many of these steps to speed up the process. And uh, what you can do is you can do whole cell solubilization and uh, in this whole cell solubilization, add your tea bag, uh, incubate, wash and purify. Uh, you can apply it also at the membrane protein stage, sort of the membrane stage where you solubilize the membranes, or you can also apply it at the stage where you have your cleared solubilization. And this all delivers quite some time, uh, time gain. Uh, we applied it to a, a range of different proteins uh, from different protein classes and also looked at different expression hosts. So the CLC1 and the acroporin are expressed in, in yeast. The, the, the PAR2 and the KCC2 are expressed in insect cells and MRAY is a bacterial protein is expressed in, in bacteria. And what we, uh, uh, what we observed is that uh, in most of the cases, uh, you get uh, quite comparable uh, purification. In some cases, you see that the purity uh, may be slightly, uh, slightly less for KCC2 and CLC1. And interestingly, for acuporin 10, uh, it, it looks like t bag purification uh, even gives an added benefit on the purity of the of the protein but surprisingly and 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 to our uh, pleasant surprise uh, in in many cases uh, we see slightly improved size exclusion profiles and and particularly for cases e2 we see a much sharper peak here uh, compared to the conventional purification and uh, less of this larger form and we know from SPR that this larger form is, is uh, ligand binding incompetent, whereas this, uh, the, the smaller and the sharper peak is ligand binding competent. Uh, so what we uh, what we feel is we we definitely have a uh, advantage with uh, respect to the time uh, that purification takes, but also the hands-on time that allows us then to do other things in between. Uh, we believe that the quality is, is uh, equal and in some cases exceeds actually conventional methods. And it's very scalable. You can uh, basically just add more tea bags uh, and, and also you can very simply parallelize this. So if you have multiple um, 
multiple preparations, you can just do the multiple preparations and, and add tea bags to all these in, in different bottles. What we did see was somewhat reduced yields. Uh, but then again, if we go to cryo and cryo EM, who cares about yields? Uh, and uh, to illustrate that this is not only that something that we uh, what, that we do for a publication, it is actually something that we apply in in live projects. And recently, uh, I've applied it to a uh, an orphan GPSR uh, where tea bag purification gave a very nice pure sample. And I realized this is just a band on a gel, but uh, it's also accompanied by a nice size exclusion profile. Uh, and with that, I want to switch a bit gears and look at um, a specific project that we've been working on. And that is uh, a protease activated receptor. Uh, protease activated receptors, there's uh, uh, class A, GPCR, there are four family members and they have a extended N-terminus, which is sensitive to proteases. And uh, once these proteases have cleaved at a specific site in the N-terminus, the N-terminus actually uh, auto-activates uh, the receptor and leads to downstream uh, G-protein signaling as well as this beta restin mediated signaling. Now it's... Uh, these receptors can also be activated by externally added peptides. So the, the, the same sequence, this L SLIGKV peptide, if you add that, uh, even in the absence of the, the cleaved end terminus, you also get G protein uh, mediated signaling and uh, beta restin signaling. The picture is, is, uh, is, is more complicated as I, I paint it here because there are other proteases that can actually deactivate uh, also the N-terminus. There, there are also proteases that can cleave at a different site and uh, the actual cleavage without the N-terminus also induce some signaling. Uh, but the main mechanism is via this N-terminal cleavage and then auto-activation. Auto now these part twos are interesting because they're uh, related to many inflammatory processes and, and hence they are involved in many different uh, diseases. And uh, so uh, in 2001 AstraZeneca started a, a collaboration with a Heptaris company and Heptaris uh, uh, has this star technology, which is uh, originating and, and, and pioneered in Chris, uh, Chris lab. And uh, so in that process, uh, through systematic point mutations and, and carefully analysis of, of thermal stabilization, uh, Heptaris can generate stabilized receptors. Uh, and it's shown here in the graph on the on the left, yeah, left bottom. Uh, here you see in blue the wild type. It's uh, poorly, very poorly expressed, and um, has a low uh, thermal stability. And by introducing five uh, point mutations uh, through a careful recombination of individual point mutants. Uh, you see an increase in expression level and also an increase in, in stability. Uh, and finally, the construct that was used for crystallization that included 10 point mutations. You see uh, a, a, a very good expression and a very high thermal stability. Now, on top of these point mutations, uh, there was also further engineering required. So. Uh, introduction of, or first of all, cleavage of the N-terminal domain uh, and or truncation or cleavage uh, and introduction of fusion proteins, T4 lysozyme and the N-terminus, as well as the strategy of replacing the intracellular loop, in this case with Brill, uh, as well as uh, truncation of the C-terminus. So uh, Chris has a, has a talk titled Whipping GPCRs in, into shape. And 
uh, this is clearly one of the examples where considerable whipping was required to get a uh, well uh, or, or decently behaving uh, protein that could be used in uh, uh, in various uh, essays and, and applications. And to illustrate uh, how we use, I will introduce a molecule. This is the AZ8838. And uh, this molecule that originated from a high throughput screen, a cellular high throughput screen based on uh, elevation of intracellular calcium in a, in a flipper assay. And from the ACS, there were, uh, well, uh, the, the, uh, it was moderately successful, I would uh, describe it, but there was a, a molecule in, in this series um, a single ton, which means that there was not multiple proteins that had the same core or scaffold, and it was pure. It was poorly uh, inhibiting, and in the absence of um, of biochemical reagents to probe target engagement or to confirm target engagement and and to look at structures. These singletons, and, and particularly if then there is a, a poor or a very steep SAR, are for chemists really difficult to, uh, to develop. Uh, but if you can confirm target engagement and you can look at, at target binding uh, and eventually also at structures, then suddenly uh, there is a lot more scope for developing uh, compounds and, and for evolving compounds. And that is where this uh, the biochemical uh, stable and, and well-behaving part two protein comes in. So what we uh, what we uh, could do is we could uh, ah sorry. Uh, what was interesting uh, with this compound is that uh, depending on the assay, how the set assay was set up. Uh, we could see shifts in the, the potency. So with a very short incubation or with co-application, this molecule in the cellular assay uh, showed a very modest potency. If you pre-incubated the cells with this compound uh, for 15, 30, 60 minutes, what you see is that your potency, apparent potency, improves so the compound becomes more potent now what could that be and how could that uh, where could that originate from and uh, for that uh, we looked at a, uh, a biocore uh, spr assay where the stabilized protein was immobilized on the, on the chip and uh, small molecules are then flowed over and, and the mass change is measured and from that, what we observed was that uh, this specific compound has a, has a low on rate and a very low off rate. So the residence time of the compound is in the order of two hours. And particularly considering the, the modest affinity of this compound, uh, that is surprisingly, uh, surprisingly long. Uh, now, how how can that be explained? Uh, and for that, we uh, we looked at a structure that uh, was solved for this uh, for this molecule, and uh, we used lipidic cubic phase crystallization uh, in the presence of this compound, so co-purification and then crystallization, and could solve the structure to uh, 2.8 angstroms. And what you can see is that uh, the the molecule binds quite deeply inside the GPCR and it's uh, it's basically fully excluded from the solvent. Uh, it, it binds under this ECL2 and uh, really nicely fits into a small pocket which is formed in the in the middle of well almost in the middle of this part two uh, receptor. We confirmed this binding pocket by point mutations. And uh, what you also see is that uh, it, it, it really is quite nicely fitting there inside this pocket and there's little room to, to expand. So this, uh, this binding mode suggests uh, clearly conformational changes uh, and 
uh, locking of this molecule inside and underneath the ECL2 uh, probably explains why the uh, both the on rate and the off rate are uh, are slow. Now it also highlights that uh, further developing of this compound or, or extending the compound with additional groups uh, wasn't uh, successful simply because the pocket is uh, is not large enough to uh, to allow additional chemical groups to be uh, uh, to be present. So the, the 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 star, the structure activity relationship, uh, as chemists use it, was very uh, very steep. So there's there's modest opportunity for further optimizing. Uh, this compound, uh, and uh, as there's uh, there was there was little uh, additional opportunities for optimizing. We also looked at a different hit finding strategy, uh, and again there is the biochemical reagent, the purified stabilized receptor was really key, and that is DNA encoded library screening, and that's a. Uh, a methodology that we have uh, last year internalized. We have collaborated with XCAM, a company specialized in this, and we've uh, licensed in and, and internalized their methodology. This is based on uh, libraries which are synthesized on a piece of, uh, of DNA, a bar code of DNA and uh, by smart combining and doing uh, chemistry, uh, splitting, recombining, you can get uh, huge libraries in, in the order of, of billions of compounds uh, of molecules in a single tube. And each of these molecules, they can be identified through their uh, DNA barcode. And uh, so if you compare our high throughput screening compound libraries in the order of uh, 2 million compounds. Uh, here, uh, here we are, uh, we have a number of libraries and in total, I think we have uh, in the order of 10 billion uh, compounds in these DNA encoded libraries. So you, you have really a huge opportunity of, of screening chemical space. Now, what you then do is you, uh, uh, you combine these libraries with your protein of interest and what will happen is that uh, some of these molecules that, that have affinity for your target that will bind to the protein, uh, you then immobilize your protein, you wash away everything that is, is non-bound and you repeat that process uh, a, a few times. And basically then by a heat elution step you elute finally uh, all the compounds that were bind to the protein of interest. And then you apply your next generation sequencing to look at what is the DNA sequence of all these tags, uh, all these barcodes. And from that, you can identify which compounds had high affinity for your uh, protein of interest. Then the, the subsequent step is to make a selection of those compounds, do the uh, resynthesis, but then off DNA, uh, and then confirm with a, a functional assay that actually the, the binders that you identify in this process actually also have a functional effect on your on your protein. And uh, we applied that for um, for part two as well using the stabilized uh, reagents. And there we identified a, uh, a series, uh, benzimidazole, named after the group here in the middle, benzene and imidazole. And uh, what you can see is that, uh, that on SPR, uh, these molecules were quite potent. And also in, in uh, a number of the cellular assays, these were quite potent. Interestingly, in the assay, where the cell-based assay, where the uh, part two is activated by the trypsin and not by its peptide, we see a, uh, a drop-off in potency and that, that highlights really the need for using your most relevant assay to drive your chemistry forward. Uh, 
Now also by SPR, the binding kinetics, they are, uh, they are much more uh, in, in line with expectation. So uh, uh, fast on, fast off, and the residence time in the order of, of minutes, which is ex expected for this, uh, this KD. And uh, what we then also uh, looked at, so what happens if we have our 8838 compound as well? Uh, and that hardly affected the binding of this uh, this this uh, this molecule. So that indicates that these molecules they bind at different uh, pockets, and and binding of one doesn't exclude the binding of the other compound. Now also here we uh, we solved the structure. This structure was. Uh, to somewhat less resolution, uh, but sufficient to, to model the molecule in the, in the density. And what we saw is that this molecule surprisingly binds actually on the outside of the receptor between helices two, three, and, and four. And, and there is some sort of a, of a pocket formed. And again, by mutagenesis, uh, we got, could confirm that this pocket indeed is the the, the, the binding pocket for this molecule. And uh, interestingly, then looking in more detail at the trypsin activation assay. So for the 8838, it, it's not overly potent, uh, but it's nice monophasic. For the uh, 3451 compound, what, uh, what we saw is, is uh, a biphasic uh, profile, which is uh, obviously highly intriguing. And this biphasic profile was only present when the protein was activated by trypsin and not by, uh, by the exogenous peptide. And then looking in detail at some of these point mutations, so uh, for a uh, mutated phenylalanine or this 157 residue. Uh, the interesting thing is that this uh, high affinity or, or uh, site was lost, but the low affinity inhibition transition was still present. So from that data, it suggests that actually this, this molecule has multiple binding sites on the, on the protein. Uh, this binding site being the, the high affinity binding sites and, and the highly potent binding site. And somehow there must be an additional binding site with a lower potency, which presumably is only present in the uh, part two form, which is activated by the trypsin and where the N terminus auto activates. Uh, we don't fully understand it, uh, but um, uh, the data suggests that there is an additional binding site. And uh, uh, with that, uh, you obviously want to know whether actually these molecules do what they, uh, what they are supposed to do. And for that, we used a, uh, a red model where you look at uh, pore swelling. And, um, uh, so these the rats are injected in a pores with a protease for the activation of the of the receptor or or uh, the exogenous uh, peptide, and that triggers the swelling that can be shown here in the black line. So after uh, after thirty minutes, you have hundred percent swelling, and then after a few hours, it sort of subsides again. And uh, then what you do is you pre-treat these animals subcutaneous for this molecule or, or oral uh, administration for the 8838 molecule. Uh, and, and then you activate uh, the, the receptor or you, you aim to activate the receptor with uh, trypsin or with the peptide. And what you then look at is swelling. And here you can see that for the 8838, you get approximately a 40% reduction in the swelling. And for the three, four, five, one, there is about a uh, a sixty percent reduction in in the swelling, and um, that is not only the swelling but also the uh, 
histological analysis showed that uh, there is less inflammatory signals in the tissue of the of the pores. So these molecules, they actually are uh, doing what uh, what they're supposed to do, which is uh, of course very promising. Now, what I hope to have given you an idea on how these uh, purified membrane proteins, how they can be used and, and what the value is in our drug discovery processes uh, and, and clearly DNA encoded library screening and, and, and structure and, and wouldn't have been possible with this high quality reagents. Having said that, it is still uh, a challenge and uh, for part two, the number of different compound structures that we could determine was relatively uh, relatively low and cost quite some uh, some efforts. But these structures really do give a lot of input to uh, to the chemistry and understanding of the mode of action. Uh, so then, looking forward, so uh, what uh, what do we experience and, and what do we expect in in the near future? Uh, so we see an increasing complexity of the of the targets, uh, and from uh, genomics initiative, uh, for example, we get more targets where there is less known, uh, which which puts additional challenges uh, on us. Uh, we definitely see a, uh, a lot of demand and, and opportunities for further application of DNA encoded library screening. And again, also, if you think about uh, novel targets where there is little precedence, there are no tool compounds, then DNA encoded library screening might also be a very rapid tool to find your initial tools, but also as a hit finding method. Uh, and uh, particularly combining uh, different uh, hit finding strategies like HTS and, and Dell uh, together with structure-based uh, drug discovery, you can hybridize series and uh, that is a very fruitful way of, uh, of going forward. And then we've been uh, touching up that on that already yesterday, uh, clearly the cryo uh, revolution is something that we uh, we see uh, happening and we are uh, applying that as well uh, and, and here are uh, 2d class averages of a, a gpcr that that we are working on and I, I just find it amazing that you actually can see here your g protein and, and your some uh, indication of helices in your in your my cell and that is uh, uh, we see that, uh, particularly for the, the larger membrane proteins, that is really the way to, uh, to go. And uh, crystallization uh, will remain important uh, for many projects, but uh, cryo-EM will just grow. And uh, I'm convinced that it will deliver uh, more uh, more quickly and, and a richer source of information. And there, I think the uh, chemists and, and well, basically everybody, we also need to develop our understanding of how can we use, for example, the dynamic information that we get from cryo-EM structures for the design uh, of, of novel chemistry. Uh, so I think it's a very exciting time for the field of membrane uh, membrane proteins, and uh, clearly uh, the work that I presented is based on uh, many uh, many different people, uh, and I'm just a small uh, piece in the puzzle. Uh, for part two, uh, Heptaris, who uh, who has. Um, basically uh, generated the, the, the protein reagents and then transferred the technology for us to uh, generate additional protein. XCAM for the screening, University of Queensland for the, the animal model, and then uh, many people involved in AstraZeneca as well uh, in, in different areas of the, of the company. Uh, 
the tea bag purification that has been a, uh, a very nice and, and fruitful co collaboration between uh, University of Copenhagen, Lund, uh, Gothenburg, and uh, and the groups at at AstraZeneca. And uh, with that, I uh, would like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I think we can uh, open up for questions. Thank you so much, Arian. Uh, I think we all totally agree that we are in a very exciting time uh, concerning structure bolus. So we are uh, not a little bit late, but we can take just a couple of questions and then maybe we can keep some of the questions for the general discussion later on. So I'll just take a few of the first one that came in. And uh, one question was about tea bags, if they are reusable. Uh, yes, they are reusable. So uh, you can uh, you can basically wash them uh, after illusion. Uh, so, for example, flag tech, we uh, we do the, uh, the the glycine low pH and then a, a recalibration in normal pH and then washing in your detergent buffer again, and then you can reuse them. Also, if you can use other um, resins than iMac. Or have you used other resins than iMac? Uh, yes, so we, uh, we've we used uh, affinity resin like Map Select Sure for FC flag. We have used a range of different iMacs. Uh, we haven't been very successful with the ion exchange uh, resins, uh, but the, the high affinity resins, they, uh, they work well for us. Uh... Have you used, uh, for membrane proteins, uh, have you used uh, SMA smops for uh, in the tea bag system as well? Uh, no, uh, no, we haven't. We, we'd love to, uh, to do that. We haven't really uh, gotten uh, the, the SMOLP uh, routine uh, and, and protocols in, in our labs. And uh, uh, I'm... I'm looking forward to do that, but uh, there is only so much you can do. Okay, just a few more questions concerning your <clears throat> the second uh, project or your presentation part. So the mutations, um, how were they selected? <clears throat> yeah, so that is uh, that's based on uh, on systematic uh, mutations. Uh, so starting from uh, basically, well, not not one, but residue residue for residue uh, point mutations, carefully looking at the pharmacology and, and the thermal stability, uh, identifying those that are more stable and then recombining that. And uh, so that is uh, technology and, and that was uh, done at, at Heptaris. And I'm sure Chris will show more about that in, in his talk, uh, but it's a systematic changes, careful thermal stability assessment and, and recombining those. Just one like, last question that I take there, is the, uh, this N-terminal lysozyme, uh, does that affect the on and the off rate for, the, for your compounds? I suppose also that goes along with the mutations. How, how do you know that those do not affect your? Uh, the on and off rate, that, uh, that is independent on the, uh, that is in, in largely independent on the T4 lysozyme, and that is based on the cell uh, assay data that we have, which, in, in which we use uh, clearly non-modified uh, part two, and we see this pre-incubation effect that if you incubate longer, you get a, um, a higher apparent potency. 